Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another edition of our weekly recap. Um, this this week we're having a really special edition where we're joined by uh, uh, Amit Gajala, who is the co-founder of Stator Labs, uh, Daniel Dazon, a founder founder of Swell Networks, and uh, Ken head head of institutional sales at Pendle. And we're going to be diving into one of the I'd, I'd say the hottest sector this year in DeFi, which is liquid staking and uh, LST Fi, which essentially refers to uh, protocols that are building on top of liquid staking tokens to help um, traders kind of uh, manage risk, boost deals, and do all all sorts of crazy stuff. So um, before we dive into that, we're going to start with a quick uh, overview of how Ethereum got here in the first place. You know, it's been it's been quite a long road. Ethereum turned eight uh, last month, so yeah, uh, a lot of great stuff planned for the stream. And before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Bumper. That uh, it's a DeFi protocol that lets you defend your crypto from market crashes and downside volatility. And that's probably something that might have come in handy yesterday, right? So um, I hope everyone escaped unscathed after the carnage we had yesterday. And so let's uh, dive right in. All right, so taking us back right to the beginning. Uh, so what is Ethereum? Ethereum is a public blockchain, of course, that um, enables the execution of smart contracts. Uh, most of us have used it. And uh, how is it different from a centralized exchange or any centralized database? It's basically a global network of computers that are working together and they need to reach consensus and say that, okay, a transaction is valid or not. And if it is, it's appended to the end of the blockchain, can't be changed after that. That's the whole um, concept of immutability. And you know, uh, that's how blockchains work, of course. Um, uh, Ethereum started out very similar to Bitcoin um, with a proof of work consensus algorithm um, in which miners, which are essentially computers running pieces of software that uh, try and crunch these incredibly complex mathematical problems um, in order to uh, earn rewards, right? And um, in this era, of course, uh, Ethereum was emitting uh, new ETH every block as rewards to these miners. And uh, one of the main challenges of this algorithm, of course, is uh, the environmental impact, right? Because the energy consumption was going uh, uh, off, off the charts, especially back in uh, 2021 during the bull market. I mean, we were just, uh, I mean, I think we had daily comparisons of, uh, you know, which countries uh, Ethereum's consumption was crossing, right? So uh, obviously something needed to be done. And um, I think it also had a big impact in terms of um, institutional interests because uh, a lot of institutions have ESG mandates, right? So they don't invest in dirty tech, oil and gas, stuff like that. So um, there were, I'm sure there was a, that also played into uh, the Ethereum Foundation and the community's uh, decision to switch away from proof of work to proof of stake. And as we actually, before we move on, you can see from the chart that since the transition, um, there's been roughly 2000 X, I think, or one 2000th the power consumption now as we had uh, under proof of work. So that's uh, quite amazing. So, yeah. So of course, Ethereum 2.0, which is a name that we don't use anymore, but back then that was uh, the buzzword. Right. So uh, the idea was that uh, Ethereum would switch from proof of work to proof of stake. The idea being that, uh, you know, after running for so many years, the like Ether as a token was sufficiently decentralized, like enough holders had it. And it was time to switch to uh, a new mechanism by which people who held ETH could stake it and uh, run validators themselves in order to secure the network process transactions, basically take on the role that miners had until this point. So uh, with a lot of fanfare, just before the bull market actually kicked off in earnest, uh, we had the Beacon Chain launch in December 2020. And I remember it well, because that was when DeFi tokens were just bleeding, 
and everyone thought the sector was dead and uh, uh, yeah and of course as we know now you know uh, 2021 the first half of 2021 for OG DeFi was uh, a sight to behold um, and uh, who knows if we're ever going to see those kind of uh, runs for those tokens again but uh, anyway I digress <laughs> uh, just memories, right? Yeah, yeah. No. So uh, the Beacon Chain launched in December 2020. And at the time, it was basically a one-way street. You could stake your ETH, but you had no way of knowing when or if. Uh, not if. That's, I mean, uh, it was always on the roadmap. But you had no way of knowing when uh, you'd be able to withdraw that ETH. Because uh, uh, at the time, like there was no timeline given. It was quite nebulous. And, uh, you know, Ethereum has faced a lot of delays in the past. So it was a real leap of faith for those who decided to, you know, as soon as it went live, let's take. It was the true believers, I'd say, who, you know, took the leap and said, all right, you know, we trust in uh, Vitalik, let's go for it, right? So this gave rise to the whole concept of uh, liquid staking and the industry as a whole, I'd say, uh, with the launch of Lido, which launched just a few weeks after the Beacon Chain went live. Um, and this solved two problems. One, it uh, took away the need for people to have the technical knowledge to run a node themselves, which is not a casual undertaking, even today, I I'd say, right? Um, because, and why is this important? It's because if you are running a node uh, and you have your ETH state, if your node goes down and you have, um, uh, you know, issues and it, uh, you have downtime, you get slashed, you essentially lose money. Uh, your staked ETH uh, is at risk. If uh, you're not, uh, if your road is not, if your node is not up to a par, essentially. So that was one challenge. And the main challenge, of course, was that uh, people wanted access to their liquidity. Uh, you know, since withdrawals from the beacon chain weren't enabled, uh, Lido gave people a way to essentially um, have their cake and eat it too, right? So they could participate in securing Ethereum, while at the same time, they'd get this. Uh, kind of receipt token representing their stake teeth called well stake teeth i guess um uh which was liquid and could be deployed across DeFi and uh, used i mean today it's almost i'd say equivalent to using eth across DeFi with the amount of integrations that uh, uh lido has managed to uh, put together uh, but back then, it was, uh, you know, it was still a niche. And, you know, um, uh, even as late as last year, when uh, Three Arrows collapsed and uh, there was a slight de-pegging event of uh, stake teeth, it was, uh, it caused a lot of FUD around the whole liquid staking uh, industry, I'd say, right? That was, uh, last summer was quite uh, <clears throat> brutal for the markets. I mean... Mm. Uh, compared to compared to then, to, I mean, we're still two x higher in terms of ETH and uh, Bitcoin. I'd say so. All right, and of course uh, we had the Shanghai upgrade that finally up, um, enabled withdrawals for the first time. This happened in April, and the liquid staking industry, I think, really took off after this happened because this took away one of the main risk factors that. Uh, were associated with liquid staking, meaning could you actually get your ETH back at some point if you wanted it, right? And um, uh, with uh, the Chappelle upgrade and uh, withdrawals going live, uh, that was taken out of the equation because uh, it w didn't happen immediately, but uh, I think over the next weeks, all the major liquid staking providers uh, uh, started to introduce functionality to kind of get your ETH back. Rede redemption started to be... Um, uh, enabled and uh, that I think gave uh, people a lot more confidence to use these uh, providers and we can see that um, in the Lido TVL chart right so uh, this is den denominated in ETH because I thought it will give a better idea of um, rather than a dollar chart which shows you know the TVL down here somewhere but you can see that in terms of ETH it's just been straight up it's ex um except for when we had the Terra collapse. I mean, that uh, battered, I think, uh, every protocol because uh, the contagion effect was so much. Um, 
because a stable coin vanishing means uh, you had uh, people who got liquidated on positions where they had borrowed USD against, say, ETH and other things. And uh, um, that really took uh, the industry back quite a while, I think, to uh, it, it took the industry quite a while to recover from that. So we had the UST DPEG, but again, after that, it's just been uh, straight up and to the right. And uh, after Shanghai, yeah, you can see it's uh, gone through the roof, essentially. Which brings us to the current state of liquid staking, where there's about 20 billion worth of uh, ETH staked through liquid staking protocols. But this pie chart also gives us uh, a reason to pause, right? You can see Lido has nearly three quarters of the market, which is, uh, of course, a concern. You know, being DeFi, <laughs> we value uh, decentralization uh, above almost everything else, right? So um, today we're going to be speaking to uh, some of the guys who are looking to, uh, I guess, take a piece of the pie away from Lido. And uh, uh, I think let's start with uh, Daniel, if you'd like to talk about um, what you guys are building at uh, Swell Network. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm the founder of Swell. Um, Swell is an up and coming Ethereum uh, liquid staking protocol. Yeah, quite right. Um, agree with the uh, overall assessment here. It's, it's incredibly important that we maintain a diverse and decentralized liquid staking market um, that sort of preserves the underlying decentralization, security, and value. Um, of Ethereum, and it's also uh, incredibly uh, sort of uh, uh, optimistic to see just the rise and rise of liquid staking and the de-risking of uh, staking writ large post Chappella. And we can see that in the chart moving uh, like post Chappella uh, in April of this year, um, that there has been more validators coming online. Uh, the queue still, uh, I think, about 25 days to get in, and there's virtually uh, uh, nothing to get out. So there's just been a, a massive... Uh, demand for liquid staking, and we've been a real beneficiary of that. Um, so we've been live on mainnet since about April of this year, uh, late April. Um, so just a touch over three months, and uh, we're one of the fastest growing uh, uh, protocols in DeFi. Um, and um, we're really trying to uh, be a base layer and accelerate for um, what is now the biggest category in DeFi, which is liquid staking overall. And yeah, quite rightly pointed out that the industry generally is a valuation of about 20 billion. Um, I'm not sure what the latest uh, is at the moment, just with the quotational drop in Ethereum recently, but um, with, with Swell Network in particular, um, we're just uh, uh, over the past three months, we've been able to uh, secure uh, just over 45,000 each state with uh, more than 10,000 unique depositors. And we've been really buoyed by um, this particular campaign which we call The Voyage, which is in summary, a uh, pre-token uh, airdrop campaign uh, for people to get involved and to reward early adopters and stakers into our ecosystem. And that ecosystem of our LST, which is uh, Swift or Swell Ether, um, has been increasingly and rapidly uh, integrated within the DeFi ecosystem. And yeah, very, very excited to share more about Swell and uh, talk all things liquid staking with you all. Cool. I'm kind of curious, yeah. you know, we saw that pie chart and how semi you know, for the most part centralized it is what's to stop swell from becoming the next Lido, and then if, if you guys do have that type of supremacy in the marketplace how would you introduce sort of layers of decentralization within the organization in terms of the protocol level yeah i think it's um it's a it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great question um and it's a question that has to be answered like in in a, in a holistic fashion between the social layer i.e. layer zero or the consensus, or social consensus, as well as just generalized uh, market forces, um, quite rightly that uh, you know, there is a, a potentially an un unacceptable share of market <clears throat> from Lido, but by the same token, Lido has also uh, paved the way uh, for um, uh, liquid state protocols. Um, generally speaking, in um, avoiding a situation where we had market share captures from centralized exchanges, but by the same token, there is a situation wherein um, any particular protocol um, uh, that has um, a, a certain share of market uh, may be a, a risk um, to, to Ethereum. 
And there's been various sort of thresholds placed upon that. Um, so, for example, one of the seminal pieces came out of um, Danny Ryan, who said, you know, no, no uh, particular protocol or, you know, uh, should have more than 25%. Um, Light is already well past that um, on the cusp of a 33% threshold. And there's other thresholds of 51% and 66%. Um, but by the same token, for a new and up and coming protocols like Swell, um, and others who have uh, recently come to the fore. I think that's important from a market competitive standpoint. And I think that we are far and away um, from uh, achieving that particular share of market, um, largely because of the fact that there are these in inherent flywheels and flywheels, which lead to sort of these power law distributions amongst liquid staking protocols. And there is this, always this uh, sort of uh, counteracting force between uh, public and private interests in the sense that do LDO token holders um, how, how do their interests relay with stakeholders, relay with each stakers, relay with Ethereum writ large, relay with the entire blockchain ecosystem? I would and follow that's always a, Oh, go on. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, feel free to jump in any time. Uh, tell me if I'm sort of just rambling on here. I mean, um, I would follow that up by asking then in that case, what what on the in terms of an incentive stack can you do to build towards that from here? Yeah, this has been partly, uh, this is a question, like, is, is like, how does one uh, appropriately uh, utilize sort of commercial incentives or economic incentives and disincentives to try to drive um, new e-state and current e-state to shake that out, um, to bring it to newer protocols, i.e. protocols like Swell. And one of the techniques that we've done um, in the early stages of our voyage just TLDR, the Voyage is our early token campaign. We're going to do like several chapters or seasons, which will then lead to the instantiation of the DAO or our TGE. Um, we, we've you know carved out a, a portion of our uh, overall supply to um, early stakers. And then as a result, we're able to offer a higher blended yield um, because at the base layer, the staking rate is largely commoditized because it's just issuance from the Ethereum blockchain um, for staking. But there is that component where you can you know, give and bootstrap um, your uh, uh, token, uh, your, your stakers with, with the governance token, um, and at the same time try to drive as much utility and integrations as possible. And we try to do that, like we have folks like Pendle here on this call, um, who's been a major uh, uh, sort of collaborator with Swell. And together, like by enabling that LST5 stack with um, Sweet and the yield trading components and, and sort of the balance or a Pendle sort of stack and then going through to Equilibria and Pen by like those sorts of um, interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, daisy chain of yield plays. If people want to do that uh, particular thing, you can you can carve out a bit of a section of the market for yourself. Um, but by the same token, I mean there are other things that one could do as a protocol as well, um, and there are various levels of, of, of aggression. But yep. it's just about the timing and sequencing thereof. Interesting, interesting. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Amit now to talk a little bit about uh, EFX. And, uh, and then a general question for both of you being, um, how is your product different from, say, Lido's or Rocket Pools, who are the, uh, you know, the current leaders in the market, right? So, Sure. So quick, and thanks. Thanks a lot, guys, for having us here. Um, my name is Amit. I'm one of the co-founders of Stator. Uh, so Stator has been a multi-chain liquid staking protocol. Uh, we currently have about uh, 140 million uh, total assets staked across several blockchains. Uh, we're one of the market leaders on Polygon. And uh, we started our journey on Terra 1.0, had about a billion dollars in TVL. And then uh, after the collapse, we aggressively expanded to several chains. Uh, we are very early entrant in Ethereum. Uh, just launched about a month ago, have about 15K each staked uh, with us with several integrations across Curve, Balancer, uh, Wombat, Pancake, Pendle, etc. Uh, like growing, growing pretty quickly. So that's 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 a that's a little bit about Stator and Etex is our liquid staking token on Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it's a reward bearing token that kind of increases in price every uh, every time rewards are accumulated. Quickly talking about the, I think that's a that's probably a good segue into your question, Vivasi. How are we different from the existing uh, players in the ecosystem. <clears throat> so, uh, Ethex is a is a very different architecture, which is a combination of uh, uh, the way I look at Ethex is it's a it's a two sided marketplace. On one side, you have 
you have the liquid stakers that can stake any amount of eth to get ethx uh, which which kind of increases in price as rewards are accumulated on the other hand on the other side of the marketplace is these node operators uh, they, they can be like any type of node operators professional node operators or small and medium size node operators who want to just run ethereum validators right the fundamental premise with which ethx was uh, ethx was born was that we want to create access to these uh, small and medium size node operators because if you look at the landscape the entry barrier or the capital entry barrier for these node operators is significantly higher in the market for a solo staker it's about 32 eth and uh, ignoring the price drop over today and yesterday that's it roughly about $64000 right and eth is at $2000 which is a significantly high barrier to entry for anybody to start an ethereum validator even some of the other protocols that allow uh, uh, that, that allow permissionless node operators uh, they had a barrier of about 16 eth now i think they have close to 4. 10.4 ETH, which is which is again a significantly high barrier to entry, right? Which is probably close to 25,000 odd. Uh, now imagine somebody who wants to run 10 nodes. He has to cough up like 250k worth of uh, worth of capital on his own. Uh, and and you can one can imagine, right? How difficult or hard it is for somebody to to start a to start at least a small number of nodes. So that was one of the biggest uh, things that we wanted to solve in the ecosystem. where we reduced a uh, bar capital barriers to entry to almost 4.2 to just 4.4 eth where 4 eth is the actual eth that they need to bond and 0.4 eth is the amount of sd tokens that they need to bond sd is our governance token uh, the second problem that a lot of these node operators face is they don't want exposure to any other token other than eth so we wanted to bring that down as much as we can while we also creating some utility as well as uh, uh, downside protection for any kind of negative slashing events etc so that's that's the fundamental premise of uh, what where we started with ethex as we as we started thinking about this uh, sooner than later when like, we we are all here to kind of support uh, decentralization and crypto right this means a lot of permissionless node operators can just like bond 4.4e and start running validators right so we are creating access uh then the advantage of this is obviously now we can invite hundreds of permissionless node operators we already have about 400 plus validators 130 plus uh, permissionless node unique permissionless node operators that are operating nodes with stater at uh, 15k eth already uh sooner than later we are going to hit a supply block or a supply wall in terms of scaling the permissionless operators that's where we have this multi pool architecture where uh, we also have a set of high quality uh, operators who can spin up hundreds of nodes without any type of collateral so while on one hand we have uh, we have this pool of permissionless node operators who can just bond 4.4 eth and start running validators once this supply hits a, a ceiling we also have a Uh, have a fallback mechanism on to these permission side of node operators right we have four to five operators already on board running nodes with us the uh, just just adding further extension to this the beauty of what we've built is now this can be extended to several this this currently we have two pools this can be extended to multiple pools tomorrow if we want we can spin up a pool where only kyc operators and kyc users can deposit mm. and run nodes. can extend this to an institution that wants to run a liquid staking pool of its own without owning link funds with anybody else so this is this is kind of a general idea of ethex and the underlying architecture that we've built and it's quite different from the existing architectures in the market interesting oh amazing thanks thanks for that uh, overview i think that uh, makes a lot of sense as to you know i think yeah like you said uh, and daniel to lido kind of paved the way with uh, for the liquid staking sector with uh, you know they started off with you know fully permission you know only their operators can run nodes etc and then we're seeing progressive decentralization of that uh, stack right where uh, different projects are taking different approaches and uh, you know uh, trying to uh, uh, give users the best options 
right? All types of users, like you said, whether you have a ton of capital or very little, you should be able to participate, right? That's the end goal. Um, so uh, I'd like to ask Ken now to, so, to introduce himself and talk a little bit about Pendrel, which, is, which has been around for a long time, but I think really took off after the LST boom. And even before that, I think your marketing shift from, you know, option trading, yield trading to buying assets at a discount. I think that made it a lot simpler for DGENs to kind of understand what you guys are doing. Yeah, happy to, to start. Um, so my name is Ken. I, I hit the institutional business at Pendle. And basically what that means is um, I reach out to in different types of institutions, including um, uh, liquid yield funds, uh, centralized exchanges, wallets, and so forth, uh, to deploy different types of uh, DeFi strategies uh, using Pendle Markets. Um, I think, yeah, you hit the the nail on the head. Um, we've been around since 2021 um, and spent the first couple of years building um, the AMM uh, in our V1 and only launched our V2 in November last year. Um, since then, we've been I would say quite fortunate to be a central part of the LST Phi narrative. Um, having said that, we are not an LST Phi protocol. Uh, in fact, we are a um, fixed rates or yield trading protocol. And to to what you mentioned earlier, uh, as I said, a discount on yield trading protocol. They're basically, I guess, two sides of the same coin. Um, and we're just we've been experimenting with different narratives for different target audiences. Um, and essentially, the problem that we're solving in DeFi uh, is that the fact that in DeFi, most yields are essentially spot or floating and that there's no fixed rates markets. Uh, so Pendle is a fixed rates markets. Uh, if you look at TradFi, uh, the closest analog would be uh, the swaps markets or, or specifically the interest rate swaps markets between uh, fixed and floating rates. Um, and we, we basically provide uh, such markets for uh, any asset that is yield generating in DeFi. Uh, what's been working very well for us since uh, our V2 launch in November has been uh, a lot of different types of LST tokens, as well as um, non-LST tokens, uh, including revenue generating LP tokens from GMX or Gainstrade. Um, but having said that, the LST space is a very important uh, part of the vertical to, to Pendle. It makes up more than 50% of our TVL. Um, yeah, and very... Uh, very excited to to chat more about the space. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's exciting. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I just read um, about. I, I found out about swaps maybe a year ago, so I understand it's very. It's important as a crypto native. I didn't quite understand its importance, but realizing that it's a very important tool in TradFi was was eye opening when I read that article and made the connection. So it'll be exciting to see see how you guys do. I mean, it's definitely a little. Uh, you, you you need a little more sophistication, I think, to enter the swaps arena. And I think with a lot of these LST five products, I, I, I think generally, you know, we are waiting for DeFi to become simpler. But I almost think it's going to become more more complicated as kind of the basic basic building blocks have been built out, and now we're we're starting to play with yield, which I feel like is a more a, a more sophisticated realm of the market. I don't know what you guys think about that, but. No, exactly. I, uh, I totally agree. I think especially with e-staking yields, um, you know, now essentially serving as quote unquote, the risk-free rate in DeFi mm -hmm. um, and L LSD is essentially taking that uh, yield and making it uh, obviously very liquid. Um, but what is lacking sorely in the space is a term structure, right? Or a yield curve in DeFi. Uh, everything mm -hmm. spot, everything fluctuates from day to day depending on utilization and staking withdrawal rates and so forth. Um, but I think a swap smart, uh, you know, if, if uh, say, you know, Ethereum, the, the network can, you know, issue a yield curve per se, um, we can sort of let the market imply one via swaps market. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the goal or the angle for us uh, with, with regards to LSDs. Right, right. I think that makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, institutions don't want to deploy money day to day. Right, it's uh, they're looking for um, if they if you're raising a fund, you generally have a longer time frame and you know want to deploy deploy capital at a 
fixed fixed yield you know you want something that's predictable and uh, we don't have that in defi right so as the industry matures and we move more from you know your day trading degens to uh, hopefully more sophisticated long term investors um yeah this is um, these products are required i'd say like they form such a huge portion of traditional finance right swaps and um, I think forex of course is another huge market that defi hasn't quite cracked yet but mm. when it does that's going to be the next uh, uh, next meta probably i think and so, sorry i know we were asking ken a lot of questions but ken could you explain just like super like i'm five how do you how do you get a fixed rate out of a variable rate like the one associated with staked eth uh, I mean, just, yeah, for, for someone who, who barely, you know, maybe has taken a calculus class or something, but not much else. Yeah. Uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is to first understand the components within uh, Pendle's AMM. So we right. have to, essentially, we uh, split uh, the principal and yield portion of a yield-bearing asset. Let's let's take Lido's teeth, for example, mm -hmm. into uh, principal and yield. So PT and YT for short. Yep. Um, and the the main thing to know is that the relationship between uh, PT and YT is that they have an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at, uh, say, the swaps markets or, or TradFi markets, PT behaves very similarly to a, a zero coupon bond or to a strips bond without, without the yield, essentially. Um, and so long as you hold PT uh, to maturity, let's let's call it end of the year, uh, you will redeem uh, PT at, at par. And PT right. usually trades at a discount if you get in you know, early enough. Um, so, so that's kind of the fixed rates element. And uh, the price uh, that PT and YT trades is dictated from trading activities uh, uh, through the AMM. And that really determines uh, what the, you know, the, the moving yields would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'm getting there. Awesome. awesome. So um, now I'd like to ask you guys, you know, what our community would love to hear um, for each of the tokens and, you know, uh, that you guys have uh, created or issuing. What are the best ways to deploy them across DeFi? Where are the best yields? How do we how sh how can uh, we profit the most? Awesome. Should I, should I go first? Sure. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, right now we have, uh, since we just started about a month ago, we have over four to five uh, primary DeFi integrations. Uh, the first one is on uh, Curve, Balancer, and we are also integrated on Pendle. Uh, there's Wombat, that's a DEX from, uh, that, that's a DEX from, popular DEX from BNB. Uh, and uh, we have a few more integrations lined up across uh, a few DEXs as well as uh, learning protocols. So any user who wants to uh, uh, who wants to earn further rewards on top of their uh, ETEX, which is our liquid staking token, can uh, provide LP on Curve. I think today the yields are close. Boosted yields are, are close to about ten percent additional on Curve Convex. On um, the other one is Pendle. I think we've we've just did our bribes yesterday. There's about thirty five percent plus boosted yields on Pendle. For somebody who is uh, choosing the balancer ETH, ETH X pool, uh, and yeah, that's and on Wombat, I think somebody who wants to provide ETH X LP, there's about fifteen to twenty percent additional staking additional rewards. Oh, that sounds tasty. Um, <laughs> just to get an idea, though, uh, what are the? Uh, I haven't looked into the um, balancer pools yet, but uh, what are the? token pairings is it like the principal token paired with eth so it's or is there is it like a um yes so it's okay. the eth eth paired with our liquid stake token which is etx okay yeah that's great because i think at these prices um, very few people want to take on the risk of impermanent loss right pairing with stable um, yeah, yeah. i mean of course we could go lower but we're the true believers left if we're still here after two years of bear i mean uh, i think uh, yeah, so that's great to know. Um, Daniel, uh, moving on to uh, Sweet, um, how can we maximize our pearls, my friend? <laughs> yeah, I think um, 
Well, I think the first thing to do is just to realize that you're still early to swell everyone that's listened to this call uh, and on the call. Um, yeah, so the general rule is, you know, the earlier you stake, the bigger you stake and the longer you stake for, the more pearls you get. It's pretty simple. Um, and we've tried our best to really speed run a lot of the ecosystem integrations and partnerships across DeFi. Uh, currently we're on mainnet, but we're going to go to uh, sort of cross-chain uh, uh, ideally next week, hopefully next week if everything sort of checks out. Um, and then in terms of like the specific strategies, I think just even just on a sort of a raw um, staking play, um, because we're in this bootstrapping phase, I think it's a pretty attractive sort of play. But if you want to, you know, step through and go a bit further than that and utilize the uh, the LST suite across DeFi, you can do that. Um, and so we have the various integrations across multiple DEXs, whether that's something like a Maverick, a Balancer, uh, a Curve, or Univ3, and we have the various uh, emissions layers or meta governance layers on top of that. Um, so for example, I'd be remiss not to talk about the Pendle uh, integration here. So um, with regards to Pendle, you can do the Balancer or a Pendle stack. Um, we have a lot of materials uh, available um, and we're also happy to sort of talk you through that on, on our Discord or where, where, where have you. And then we also have a, um, we were the first um, team, I think, to externally to deploy a Pendle pool. Um, so we work with the Pendle dev team and then we've uh, done our Pendle suite pool at the moment. So you can just zap in um, from ETH into the uh, Pendle pool there and that will actually stake it for you. So you can just do that right on the Pendle UI. Um, and at the same time, you could, we're also on the Pendle earn page too. Um, if that's not really your flavor, you don't want to do the LP thing or you don't want to do the interest rate swap thing. Um, we have also other integrations with uh, protocols like Gravatar, which is a, a CDP, a uh, LSU backed stable coin. And also, even if you're not like sort of primarily going through Suite, um, we have integrations with various uh, index or structured product style uh, integrations as well. Uh, recently with um, Yearn, which is uh, bootstrapping at the moment, it's YETH product. and. Um, uh, yeah, at the high level, those are some of the, the integrations. But if you want to maximize your pearls, yeah, uh, that's the general uh, outlay. All right, that's good to know. Um, I did, um, um, well, I had a chat with your official Twitter account, not sure with, uh, who runs that. But uh, I believe that um, if you deposit uh, your suite on uh, Gravita, you don't, you don't earn pearls yet, right? Uh, yeah, so at the so at the moment with like CDPs, um, we're 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 just like generally we're working through what the incentivization uh, looks like for that. Uh, but you can um, earn pearls if you provide liquidity uh, on Gry and Sweet. So when you borrow um, Gry by collateralizing your Sweet, that uh, LP position on which is primarily on Bunny, which is a layer on top of UDV three, that's incentivized. So just generally, like at a high level. Um, the Pearl's uh, incentivization that happens with staking and LP for Swift. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm waiting for what's it called? Liquis, is it? To launch and uh, so that I don't need to lock any LIT tokens myself to get those boosted yields, right? Man, yeah. You're, you're on top of it. Yeah, you are, man. <laughs> well done. Well, you know, we do a weekly DeFi Alpha newsletter, right? So it's my job to keep on top of the yields. So uh, we you're present on it. You're best, on it. <laughs> best <field> opportunities. <laughs> well, obviously, he's bringing the heat this call, man. It's crazy. You know, talking of keeping on top of yields, we've seen the rise of uh, egg on layer for people who want to take like their stake teeth and then further see returns on it. One of the things I wanted to talk to Amit a little bit more about is something that Stater is working on to help people kind of expose themselves to DeFi while seeing Aegon Layer's value too. Can you give me a little bit more insight on that? <laughs> Caught me out there, <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, so sure. So what we've been uh, working on uh, is actually something called the Liquid Restake Token. Uh, we we've, we've just announced that uh, last week. Uh, like, I mean, we've been, we've been following Eigen Layer and all the narratives surrounding restaking. It's obviously a very interesting concept of using the Ethereum decentralized trust network or security to uh, actually secure other applications or dApps or whatnot, everything, right? Now, one of the questions that we asked ourselves is, hey, this is going to, we are all in DeFi. LST is in DeFi. Now, restaking is going to compete against the DeFi opportunities. 
the the most important question that kind of confounded us for some time was like hey how do we actually get the best of both the worlds that's where we got the, uh, the that's that was the genesis of liquid restake tokens where if somebody restakes their lsts with with the status uh, restaking contract which probably is in testnet now and pro- we're probably putting it out on the mainnet in a couple of days uh so so when when somebody stakes their lsts or eth with stata contract we restake them on a set of validators running on uh eigen layer we issue something called a uh, called an lrp for simplicity let's just call it uh, eigen eth right and then we are going to build the defi ecosystem surrounding eigen eth like liquidity pools additional reward opportunities collateralized positions etc so if if eth base staking rewards are about 4% there is sky is the limit for uh, restaking rewards right they could be 10% 15% or 20% depending on the number of services that are utilizing the restaked lsts or restaked ethereum but i think this whole thing begs the question and i forgive me for asking this i think it's a perspective that's widely held when you see these types of things stacking on top of each other is this just a house of cards is it turtles all the way down here or i mean how do we de-risk this space to make it appropriate for people to approach it and and, and thrive yeah. i think I, i think your question has the answer right we need to have fundamentally very very strong risk management practices that is where uh, that is where we if we constituting a risk committee and a dao to kind of have a close watch on what services we are onboarding what is the risk to reward ratio that we are taking right uh, so so the job of the dao or the risk committee shouldn't be like will actually be to do a deep assessment on the services and only whitelist those services that qualify certain criteria yeah, apart from general smart contract risks etc right there's going to be slashing risks there's going to be like some other potential risks that we there are there are so many unknown unknowns in this equation that till till restaking and some some of the services on top of restaking go live it's very hard for us to sort of imagine that at this stage but but having having said that if if we if we ensure that the risk management is properly in place it's a fundamentally new primitive that is going to be built on top of defi and restaking All right, it's fascinating stuff. Uh before we go forward just uh, a quick cl- uh, clip from Bumper a sponsor for this week's uh, recap. So, here's something new. Bumper your assets to defend them from price drops without losing upside exposure. You set a price floor and term length, then lock your tokens into the protocol. When your term ends, if the price has fallen under your floor, you leave with stable coins at the floor's value. Otherwise, you just take back your original asset. Bumper is going live in August and it's one of the most innovative DeFi protocols for hedging being built right now. So check out bumper.fi, there's links in the description of this video. Now back to our story. All right. Um I would have been really curious to see how uh Bumper performed in a, cr- a crash like yesterday's. Uh I've been playing with this protocol called FX, if you guys are familiar with from Aladdin DAO. So they're kind of creating this new stablecoin like dampened volatility stablecoin combined with a leverage token that lets you basically go long without uh, funding or liquidations. Mm-hmm. So um yeah it's 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 nice like for, personally it's been I feel like DeFi is kind of stagnated a bit at least 2022 maybe first half of 2023 as well. Uh it was a lot of the same old big being recycled into new uh packaging essentially and finally we're we're seeing more um you know innovation like whether it works out or not i just like to see new uh new designs being uh, attempted right that's yeah. that's why we're here to build uh, to iterate until we revolutionize the financial system right yeah not move fast and break things that too <laughs> Yeah. I I guess maybe going back to like a liquid eigen eth um I mean I I want I just wonder where the incentives lie like maybe stater will have strong risk management practices but I wonder is there going to be an incentive for some project to say 
to say yes, like let's let's take uh, eigenlayer staked ETH deposits and give a liquid token for that, and 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 can they? I don't know. I'm trying to think through whether I don't know. Like, what are the incentives there? Like, someone could like add some crazy yield on top of that, and I I don't know. Does that does that present a systemic risk? I don't know what you guys think, but. Uh, you know, and maybe it just happens, right? I mean, you know, 2008 happened and we sliced and dice, you know, till our heart's content. So um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to see what the end game is. And maybe we'll have to deal with that in like five, 10 years. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Happy to jump in there, Owen. Like, I think there is a fundamental difference between um, sort of 2008 sure. uh, GFC and this uh, daisy chaining of DeFi. Mm -hmm. And even like outside of DeFi more broadly into crypto. And the fundamental difference is just the nature of um, the blockchain, on chain yeah. transparency, yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think that, like, generally speaking, uh, just looking at the DeFi sector overall, um, the DeFi sector is really a sector that is still very much in its nascent early stages. Yeah. You know, we had DeFi 1.0 where you came out with the fundamental building blocks or primitives and a core principle of. DeFi has always been money leggers and composability. Right. And so in some way, shapes and forms, it's largely inevitable that this composability yeah. and daisy chaining will happen. Yeah. Because a lot of the financial innovation has actually been driven by a uh, hunt for yield, right. risk on sort of behavior coming from uh, principally this idea that you, are, you can be permissionless, so you don't need to uh, be a sophisticated uh you might jump through the hoops of being a sophisticated investor or being in a particular mm -hmm. jurisdiction that you can take these plays on. Yep. But by the same token, what happens is you have this um, effect, uh, derivatives, synthetics on synthetics, you have yep. this rehypothecation on rehypothecation. Yep. Um, and I would agree with the sentiments earlier mm -hmm. made that there has been a stagnation in DeFi generally where there's just a copy of a copy of a copy. Mm -hmm. This sort of simulacra of just nothingness right but but yeah. something's different with regards to things like eigenlayer like distributed yeah. validator technologies like zk and optimistic relics these are real innovative infrastructural technologies mm -hmm. wherein the yield isn't just because you're just gambling it's actually there to secure another piece of uh the fundamental blockchain technology so for example with eigenlayer there has been criticism about that but this idea of the inheritance of uh, ethereum security to build sort of um data availability layers um, application layers on top Mm -hmm. That's a different sort of proposition. And I would say the distinction between that and something like uh, collateralized debt obligations in the GFC, mm -hmm. or even, even more recently in mid-2022 with the cascading implosion of FTX, Alameda, and all mm -hmm. these sort of CeFi protocols, is that DeFi is transparent. Yep. And during that time in mid-2022, all the way through to the shaking out of that, um, DeFi worked just fine. Yeah. The, the, uh, the liquidations on Aave were fairly orderly. Yeah. Um, the bad debt was largely minimized, uh, minimized because of this notion of isolated, uh, the, the isolations. And there are definitely mechanisms such as the like, committees and, and, and so on, like, like Amit's mentioned, but also um, I would say that the layering of smart contract risks is, is largely isolated to that particular layer. Mm -hmm. um, but then it goes all the way down. So it's incumbent on users to really understand those risks and for us to improve as, a, as an industry to be able to communicate those risks up front. Yeah. Um, but yeah. No, I think that's just oh. one second. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, I think that is a great answer. And it did make me think that it'll be interesting to see, yeah, like how if you, you know, layer on the same incentives of, you know, humans want to make money but you layer that on to a more transparent system whether that you kind of reach certain equilibria which is kind of optimized in terms of risk reward in a way that like maybe the obfuscation of traditional finance there's ways in which the the the, the kind of the end where where you end up on the risk spectrum may not actually be where people are comfortable but it might be like that that defi I mean, the ideas, idealistic part of me is like you can hit a better point of equilibrium because the risks are more transparent. So that's an interesting thought for sure. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, uh, Daniel hit the nail on the head with uh, on-chain transparency, right? Yeah. All the names we saw collapse last year, all C5 players doing opaque yeah. stuff off-chain, yeah. you know, uncollateralized lending and everything. And Celsius, they paid off DeFi loans. 
yeah, as soon as they had to, right? But mm-hmm. other depositors won't see money for years, most likely, right? Like yeah. the actual clients. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, to me, I, I'm not too technically proficient, like as to how smart contracts work. But to me, Eigenlayer and uh, the whole restaking uh, idea reminds me somewhat of Cosmos and uh, the whole interchain security model that they have been talking yeah. about for a couple of years now, right? Which is, uh, you know, use the Cosmos hub to kind of rent out security to new projects so they don't have to bootstrap uh, their own validator set, etc. So, I mean, the concept seems the same. Um, so, um, if as a proof of stake, 40 odd billion value locked uh, system should be able to take on a little bit more load, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to wait and see how it plays out. Yeah. It's interesting because you see this sort of cycle of complexity in terms of the iterations of innovation that get put out in the marketplace. People who are the like on the core and the zero layer perhaps are able to adopt those. And then, you know, centralized institutions that represent potential points of failure come up to sort of dissipate those layers of complexity and allow other market players to come into the like, you know, institutional ones, for instance. And Unfortunately, while we've seen a great boost from the institutional players that have come into the marketplace driven bull markets, we've also seen that with the central institutions that come up to serve them, we're introducing systemic risk and contagion to the marketplace because as these things become hinges and focal points where individuals turn to them and trade, we start to lose some of the decentralization factor that helps to secure and create robust network practices and architectures. Yeah, a uh, quick question for Ken. Um, you know, with the rise, you guys support most of the major LSTs on the market, right? So um, in terms of inflows and your users' interest, uh, which ones are uh, people looking at right now? I think just by nature of being the largest and the most blue chip, it will definitely be Lido's D, mm-hmm. um in different forms and depending on the chain, right? So on Ethereum, obviously on, you know, native teeth and then wrap teeth on other chains. Um, but you know, we're definitely seeing different types of inflows from different users, um, obviously from Stater and from Swell, um, and also from, uh, we're, we're on Binance as well, so Wrap, Binance, ETH, uh, also some interest there. Um, but yeah, predominantly Lido's ETH for now. Yeah, maybe, that's, maybe. it was interesting, interesting to see Binance jumping into the ETH staking game. That was not something I would have predicted uh, even a few months ago, but uh, yeah, I guess they saw that Coinbase is doing really well with their product, right? So yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense because um, prior to Chapella, um, most of the staking products were basically led by exchanges, and if you look at uh, the top um, stakers today, like by by entities, it's still you know aside from from LSDs. Uh, exchanges like Coinbase, Binance, and Kraken, they're still, you know, top, I don't know, top five or so in terms of uh, percentage of uh, total uh, staking. Um, and I think now with LSD taking a lot of the, uh, essentially achieving instant PMF and, and, and post Chapella even more, right? Like it's basically gone up only. Uh, and we're basically seeing exchanges trying to play catch up uh, with CBE, with Binance ETH, uh, who knows who will be next? Uh, so I, I think that's going to be, continue to be a trend. Yeah, I think that's good for the ecosystem. I mean, they're centralized players, but it still diversifies the overall liquid staking uh, ecosystem. right? So, yeah, I think that's pretty much all the questions I had for you guys. But uh, I've kind of monopolized most of the stream, so I'm going to let uh, Owen and Jeremy uh, grill right. you now. Yeah. Just oh well yeah not a not not a grilling but I guess Ken as a head of I guess institutional sales I, I mean are are there interesting war stories or or things that you think people might not understand about how to like how do you like like what kind of clients are you approaching and and you know what is your do you like tailor your sales pitch based on a, a client's a potential client's background. Um, are they, are people like super up on ETH and they're just waiting? Are they scared about security? Are they scared about the, 
you know, the, the ecosystem's long-term viability. Um, I don't know. What is, what is that like kind of interacting with big money players? Yeah, I think um, the term institution tends mm -hmm. to be thrown around a lot, but Definitely. in yeah. practice, uh, that, there's a wide spectrum of types of institutions. So I guess on the left side of the adoption curve, there's all your uh, prop funds, liquid uh, yield funds, managing mm -hmm. some, some external LPs, uh, you know, your 20 to 50 mil type funds mm -hmm. um, that are very frontier, a lot of uh, on-chain strategies. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the guys that we tend to prioritize in terms of bringing uh, liquidity into our AMM uh, mm -hmm. and also to uh, capitalize on different opportunities from uh, locking good uh, fixed rates uh, mm -hmm. for for duration and and or to to take directional positions on their views on the yield markets. Uh, so that's one end of the spectrum, and I think on the other end of the spectrum <laughs> we have uh, say you know, a uh, staking platform or institutional staking platform that are looking to add on more uh, uh, avenues of yields uh, mm -hmm. aside from just natively staking on the beacon chain mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, wanting to introduce something like uh, Pendle Earn, which is basically long PT on Pendle, mm -hmm. uh, locking a good rate uh, to maturity and having a solution that is on DeFi that is non-custodial. I think that's uh, something that's quite in demand right now. Um, mm. A little bit of a shill here. So we, we just uh, announced a couple hours ago uh, integration with OKX Wallet, uh, uh, basically plugging in Pendle Earn as a modular uh, infrastructure into OKX Wallet. And this is, mm. I guess, the other side of the, the, the curve that we're uh, approaching different types of institutions. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Yeah, OKX has been doing, I know they partnered, or they, I don't know if they partnered, but they integrated with Starknet and I saw the TVL on Starknet go a little crazy too. So I, they're they're kind of I think experimenting with some on chain. Uh, I guess integrations would be the word. Are the uh, principal tokens um, supported on any lending platforms currently? I mean, can you leverage them up? <clears throat> yeah, you you definitely can. So the first protocol that um, announced uh, integration with Pendle to support uh, PTS collateral. Uh, was Dolomite, and over time we've seen more and more. Um, time swap being another example, and we're in discussions with quite a few uh, protocols at the moment uh, for PT specifically, simply because of uh, the way that PT behaves. I guess quite um, predictably over time towards maturity and and uh, converging to par. Um, the other use case apart from PT that has been quite interesting is. Um, some protocols are looking at ways to uh, collateralize LP positions on Pendle. Uh, so that's quite frontier, uh, mm -hmm. but some conversations are happening as well. Hmm. Interesting. We'll keep an eye on that. Fascinating. Like like strip the yield off an LP? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no. Just, just, just to collateralize. Uh, let, let's, oh. let's call it a money market protocol. Uh, okay. Taking LP as collateral um, and allowing users to borrow gotcha. off of that collateral. Gotcha. Yeah. So this would be borrowing against your balance LP tokens essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be nice to do as well. I, I've kind of haven't really personally dived into the Pendle um, pools just because I, like the strategy I'm trying to do is uh, buy some ETH at a discount and then borrow it and buy some more. So um, yeah, so I haven't found the set of protocols supporting that yet. But uh, yeah, waiting for that. Yeah. Tell us when you find it. <laughs> yeah, man, we, it'll be in Alpha. <laughs> right I, like, I really like the Gravita uh, Sweet strategy because it lets you, like if you want conservative leverage, right? Like you borrow a little bit and boost your Sweet position. You're not paying any interest. So it's like essentially free leverage. Mm -hmm. And um uh, if you have a safe liquidation price like mine, I'm not going to say it on the stream just in case I get hunted. But uh, if you have a safe liquidation price, I mean, it's a great way to uh, improve your yield, right? So, Right on. <laughs> That's good. No, I'm so glad to have you guys on, uh, on the call because uh, I rarely get to discuss these DGEN strategies with these guys.
They're like, oh no, no, we're not gonna play with it. We'll write about we're, it, but we we're busy. Play work. Play I'm busy it. working, man. I can't. Yeah. I can't do that stuff. Uh, like I said, I, there's this layer of complexity that someone like me, I just need an asset management service to be able to turn over a small portion of fees to them and then let them leverage my ETHs to maximize the yields across a number of protocols. Perhaps one will come for in the future that allows me to do it across all of these protocols. Yeah, we'll see. But yeah, thank, yeah thanks, guys. Good, good to make sure I, I do keep stepping up my game and uh, staying on top of the, the absolute cutting edge of what's happening. So yeah. I was more to learn. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Um, Likewise. So thanks so much Likewise for joining for us, us, guys. Uh, we're, we're reaching the end of the hour. So uh, unless you guys have anything else you'd like to share with the audience, um, I think we can uh, wrap up for today. Yeah, uh, I think I'm just, good. Uh, just on my Sorry. side, uh, um, yeah, I, I do think as well, it's also incumbent on the DeFi protocols to like make it as simple as possible for users. I cannot expect everyone to be, uh, you know, sort of, uh, kind of get to some of us on, on the call with it, like keep, keeping on top of something like, like I was surprised about the liquid thing, that's awesome. Um, but like, for, for, for example, with us, I think Pendle has done a really great job in sort of simplifying and bringing that down, like something like the own page. And with Swell, we're trying to all, like always come out with new features that like uh, make it as simple as possible, like liquid staking made simple, that's, that's what we, that that's our mantra and being like a gateway into LST5. So I think in the coming weeks, we're going to come out with an earn page where you can see all the strategies uh, like like nice and easily, like almost like a, like, like it's like, I don't want to use a traffic term, but like, so like a Vanguard for uh, LSTs. So you jump on and you can just see it there. It's all in one place. So, uh, but yeah, it's great sort of feedback and just hearing you guys talk about that at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same time uh, for the next weekly recap. Let's hope we don't see uh, a repeat of this week's market action next week. Yeah. And uh, stay defiant. All right. See you guys. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.